Hello, my name is Russell Swanson, and this is a brief recap of my lecture on David Hume's ethical subjectivism from the 18th century. In my last lecture, I introduced you to the thinker David Hume, um, and I focused on some of the ideas that came out of primarily his work called An Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals from about 1751, although a later version was released, I think, in 1777. Um, after his death. Uh, David Hume was, I said in that lecture, the, considered the wrecking ball of the modern era in Western philosophy because he was sort of famous or perhaps even infamous, but mo mostly famous for taking sort of contrarian positions, positions against the dominant arguments of the day. Uh, and so in the debate about ethics and the, and specifically the modern question of you know, how can we be good people and where do we think the idea of morality even comes from after the modern crisis? Hume enters this debate, right, where we've, by the 18th century, many thinkers are realizing it's problematic to tie morality to something like a divine command theory. Um, it's problematic to tie morality to a teleological conception of the universe that yields some kind of natural law theory of morality. And so the debate for many uh, that we're calling the modern ethical philosophers is how do humans construct morality? And of course, there's some easy answers to that that come out of the ancient period. Um, one of them is the Thrasymachian idea, the ideas, the position that comes out of the character of Thrasymachus from Plato's Republic, and that is that morality, you know, or justice as the word is used in the Republic, is simply the uh, creation, almost the fiction, of the strongest parts of society in order to manipulate and control the weaker elements of society in their own interests. That kind of cynical position, unfortunately, is still very plausible, I would say, in the, in the modern era, although it's not a very helpful idea of morality, even if it is at times a little tempting um, uh, as a description of something that does go on in society. Um, there's another ancient idea that uh, survives into the modern as a kind of a plausible account, and that is the um, relativism of the sophists. In my next, le in my next lecture, I'm going to deal a little bit more thoroughly with relativism. Um, I would argue, and I will argue there, that it's a very tempting idea, but it's largely tempting to those who don't understand fully its implications, uh, because it's, again, just not a very helpful position for for thinking about ethics, both in terms of how to have a good life and in terms of how to be a good person. Uh, so those two positions are possibilities, but the modern ethical philosophers that are famous and that really influence the debate are famous and influential to the extent that they don't go for the cynical Thrasymachian position and they don't go for the unhelpful relativistic position. Instead, they uh, enter a debate about whether or not humans think their way to morality or feel their way to a morality, a moral, a set of moral judgments and a morality that's not merely relative to individual perspectives or cultural perspectives. And so we saw in, in my lecture on social contract theory that Thomas Hobbes found a way to argue that we reason our way to morality. And uh, uh, David Hume, the, the wrecking ball, as he's known, right, takes the contrary position and argues, no, that we uh, feel, in some sense, our way to our moral judgments, and that, that it's a certain subset of human uh, feelings or sentiments, to use that 18th century word, uh, that uh, give rise to morality in the first place. Now, the reason why this was such an uncommon position, I think, is that the moment you say that moral judgments come from feelings and that morality is generated by reports of human uh, feelings, uh, this subjectivism, as it's known in ethics, sounds like it's going to lead inevitably to a form of relativism at the individual level, uh, which I call simple subjectivism. And that is, again, going to be addressed in my next lecture a little bit more thoroughly. But David Hume, again, is an influential modern thinker because he's aware of the modern crisis and he's going to try to offer an account, in this case, an account of morality based in sentiments that avoids relativism. And so what we call Humean subjectivism, or sometimes what I call the not-so-simple subjectivism of David Hume, uh, 
um, is going to offer us a kind of a nuanced uh, account of how moral judgments come from our sentiments. But in the lecture, I, I developed for you that the basic argument pattern that Hume offers, especially in an inquiry concerning the principles of morals, uh, is to say, look, these are the modern choices. We think our way to morality or we feel our way to morality. It, either reason is the source of morality and moral judgments or sentiments are the source of morality and moral judgments. And I'm gonna tell you why it's not reason. That's, that seems to be Hume's primary strategy here. Here's sort of the form of that argument, if you will, which we look at in, in uh, part of philosophy known as formal logic. It's either A or it's B, it's not A, therefore it's gotta be B, right? And so to flesh that out, in the more concrete version, less abstract version of that in Hume's philosophy is, you know, reason is the source of morality or sentiment is the source of morality. Let me tell you why it's not reason and therefore we have a reason, we have a cause to believe, careful of the way the word reason can be used in multiple ways here. Uh, it's either reason that's the the, the, the sort of what's behind morality and moral judgment or it's sentiment, it's not reason, so it must be sentiment. And then he adds in the course of arguing something more subtle about the way in which we derive moral judgments from sentiments in order to try to differentiate his version of subjectivism from some relativistic version of subjectivism. Um, and so to briefly recap the two most famous lectures that Hume offer, or I'm sorry, the two most famous arguments that Hume offers um, against reason's centrality in the formation of our mental, uh, our moral judgments. Uh, the first was a kind of an indirect argument involving human motivation for actions. And the argument basically goes something like this. Uh, reason alone does not cause us to act. Sentiments cause us to act. Moral judgments cause us to act. And so since both sentiments and moral judgments cause us to act, they must be pretty intimately related, sentiments and moral judgments. Since reason alone doesn't cause us to act and moral judgments do, they must not be, into more, they must not be intimately related. And so this is an argument for sentiments being more uh, central to the formation of our moral judgments because sentiments like our let's say our innermost moral judgments and beliefs uh, cause us, uh, give us good reason to, to act or to cease a certain action. Whereas we argued in the lecture last time, uh, Hume develops this idea that reason alone, uh, you might think it can, but he says thinking, cognition, reasoning, sort of logic by itself never gives us um, a cause to act. It's always at heart something about being alive and sentient, something about having the capacity to feel positive and negative feelings, likey and no likey. At bottom, Hume argues that human motivation is always tied to some version of likey and no likey. And so as we developed in the lecture, that's why, you know, if we built an incredible uh, robot with a computer brain that could reason uh, logically very well, and we turned it on, that's why it would do nothing until we tell it what to do. Because while it can reason, it can't feel. And because it can't feel uh, in some kind of conscious or sentient way, it doesn't have any version of sentiments. It doesn't have any version of likey and no likey. And so it doesn't have any motivation to take action. Okay, so that was the first argument. The second argument was a little bit, I think, I find a little bit more persuasive because it's a little bit more direct. And it's often referred to as the argument um, that reason alone cannot decide moral matters. Reason alone by itself cannot decide what's right or wrong for us. And we referred to Hume's famous murder scene uh, example, which I then fleshed out um, kind of uh, in, a, in a lot more detail in order to make a number of points about the Humean perspective on morality. And uh, you know, if I simplify that down for you, in some sense, if we explore a murder scene with all of the latest technological tools we can, what we will find are the facts, but what we won't find are the values, including the right and wrong of the situation. Uh, we won't find those human claims until we consult our own capacity to feel. And, though even, and so even though it's not us that got killed, we're, we're still upset by it. 
right? And the fact that we are still upset by it is a testament to the fact that we have a capacity for what Hume calls disinterested sentiments, uh, a kind of an unfortunate phrase uh, from the 21st century perspective, but what Hume seems to mean by that is something akin to sympathy or maybe more empathy, right? Um, the capacity to feel the pains of others or the pleasures of others, and again, more like sympathy, the capacity to be displeased by the pain of others. Even though we don't know exactly what they're feeling, we're not feeling exactly what they're feeling, their pain upsets us in a way, right? Even the pain of perfect strangers, frankly, even the pain of other species. Uh, but the joy of other species, the joy of perfect strangers can, for many of us, elicit spontaneous joy in ourselves. And that's just sort of a little bit of a strange fact of our hard wiring. We might help Hume here by saying, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, you know, we're social mammals. And apparently for all of the social mammals, this capacity to pick up on the feelings of others is kind of a crucial capacity. And Hume says that capacity, which he calls disinterested sentiment, that's the root of morality and moral judgment. And of course, we have all kinds of feelings and many of them are not disinterested. So as I developed for you the murder scene argument, uh, kind of fleshed it out for you and expanded it beyond Hume's version of it, I talked about a couple of other scenarios where maybe somebody would be happy that so-and-so was dead because they had a rivalry with so-and-so, okay? That's realistic psychologically, that happens, but it's not admirable morally. And, you know, such a self-interested sentiment, like I'm glad so-and-so is suffering because I don't like so-and-so, or I'm glad so-and-so is gone because I, I didn't, I never liked him. In fact, I hated him. That, while normal psychologically, right, in some sense, very common psychologically, is not morally relevant right? Like that person should not get, you know, we should not ask that person if the right thing has happened here, morally speaking, because they're skewed by the strength of their self-interested sentiments in this moment. If other people, for whatever reasons of birth, or perhaps for reasons of trauma, have had their capacity for empathy and sympathy somewhat beat out of them, or maybe it never functioned right to begin with, likewise, we don't want to ask that person for their moral perspective on things, right? So if that student that we talked about in the example in the last lecture just looks at the murder scene and has a kind of a neutral response and says, what are we doing now? That's a little troubling uh, psychologically, and certainly Hume, uh, based on Hume's account of morality, we wouldn't want to consult that person in terms of moral judgments. And then lastly, you know, maybe, maybe I, you know, I used myself as an example. I said, well, maybe I'm upset by the murder scene, but I'm upset because of how it affects my life. Again, while I have a negative feeling like most humans would have when they, excuse me, see the death of another human being, even a perfect stranger, um, my feelings are a little off in that moment because my feelings are so self-concerned, right? Like they're self-interested sentiments. Again, for Hume, disinterested sentiments would be the key to making a better or a more reasonable or persuasive moral judgment than uh, self-interested sentiments. And so even though I also have a sentiment of disapprobation, I have a no likey, I have a negative feeling, my negative feeling is is generated by how it impacts me. And so I'm not using my capacity for disinterested sentiment, sympathy, or empathy to make my moral judgment. And so my moral judgment is bound to be off, right? And so notice that by fleshing out this murder scene example, we've done two things. We've kind of shown how, look, reason helps us get the facts straight. And that is important, and we'll come back to it but it doesn't generate the moral judgment. And so that's kind of the Humean point. Reason alone is not central in determining right from wrong. But on the other hand, um, there's a lot of ways we could go wrong, even with our feelings, with regard to making moral judgments. And so Hume has set up a way, a subjectivist account of morality, i.e. a description of how moral judgments and morality are tied to feelings, subjectivism, ethical subjectivism, but it's not going to result in relativism, right? Because some moral judgments are going to be more appropriate than others. Some are going to be more reasonable than others. Some are going to be a better or more reliable sort of way of indicating moral right and wrong 
than, um, than, than others, right? And so we have a way of differentiating amongst uh, our moral judgments. And so, you know, I've, I've, I've reviewed now for you this idea that, you know, moral, moral values come from disinterested sentiments as values more generally, including just good and bad and beautiful and ugly, um, you know, all value judgments come from sentiments according to Hume. And he's got interesting arguments across the board there for how some, you know, value judgments based on sentiments are better than others. But specifically moral values about right and wrong and maybe good and evil and virtuous, virtuosity and viciousness, these value judgments must come, Hume says, uh, from our capacity for disinterested sentiments, must be generated by our capacity for empathy or sympathy. And so he famously says that reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions. And by passions in that famous quote, he must be referring to disinterested sentiments um, as we unpacked in, in, the, in the last lecture. And so, you know, there's just to make sure you kind of understanding the Humean position and also the sort of modernity of the Humean position, you know, listen to this and see if this makes sense to you. We call an action virtuous or right or morally good because it is pleasing to our capacity for disinterested sentiment. I'll shorten that and make it less specific, but now you understand the specifics. We call something virtuous because we like it. Importantly, it is not the case that, according to Hume, we like it because it is really virtuous, right? That would put the moral goodness, the moral rightness, the virtuosity out there in the world as something we are recognizing and responding to. What Hume is saying in light of the modern crisis as a modern ethical thinker is the goodness is not out there. There are actions out there. There are facts out there. There are relationships between facts out there. Use your mind to understand as best you can and then use this human capacity, uh, disinterested sentiment to respond. And more often than not, if we got the facts straight using reason and we use disinterested sentiments or sympathy or empathy, we would more often than not agree about our moral judgments. And that's Hume's account uh, of ethical subjectivism or Humean subjectivism. I find it a very reasonable and plausible account. What we're going to see in a couple of lectures is that one of the greatest minds of modern philosophy, the Prussian uh, philosopher Immanuel Kant is going to get a copy, trans, uh, a copy of Hume's work translated from English into German, and it's really going to rock his world and make him do some thinking. He thought he had things figured out until he ran into the wrecking ball. Um, uh, but Hume, but Kant is going to, uh, you know, say that that's persuasive. It's very good in some sense. Hume must be right about his conclusions if we agree with him that morality is grounded in sentiment, and that's why Kant's going to make it part of his life work to argue morality cannot be understood, understood as being grounded in sentiment because Hume's reasoning is good and general moral agreement is not enough. Philosophy, after 25, you know, 100 years or 2300 years at that time in the late 18th century, you know, it's shameful, it's a bit scandalous that philosophy can't explain, uh, you know, absolute moral truth. And so Immanuel Kant is going to respond to David Hume, uh, he'll be our next major thinker, uh, by trying to explain absolute moral truth, even in light of the modern moral crisis, uh, or the modern crisis in ethics, by, by putting the foundation of morality back in rationality. But we'll get there in a couple of lectures. So this completes my review of Humean subjectivism. I hope you guys are all feeling good about your lives and feeling good about what's happening to each other in the world. And if not, you know, trying to make it a little bit better. Take care.